Welcome to my thoughts on Scream Queens Season 1, Episode 12. This, this episode is called Dorcas, and these the video will have spoilers for these first 12 episodes. And yeah, another episode that I absolutely loved. And yeah, so, you know, last time I was wondering if Pete was going to turn out to actually murder someone, or if this was, you know by degrees kind of thing, but no, he actually did legit kill people, and we learn about the the deal, you know, the, yeah, so he, he spotted Boone after Boone killed the security guard. I, I really appreciate this episode clearing up some of, you know, there's at least three killers, and, you know, it's like, okay, but who killed who? We know, we know a lot of the people who have died. But, uh, yeah, also, I don't think I noted to say this in one of my, my notes. Great kills in this episode, also, you know, the, the explosion. Obviously, some CG there couldn't really be helped, but it is a really epic way to, to kill off the guy. And then we have the, you know, the, the heel in the eye kill at the very end, where she even, like, wakes up. It's just, yeah, very, very cool. But, but yeah, you know, Boone explains it, and we don't hear the explanation, but we already know what he would have said. You know, we've heard the explanation, we the audience have. And, you know, each time Boone passes the camera back and forth, the camera gets closer and closer to Pete. And his face, you know, goes from, like, being, you know, he can't believe it, and gradually he come you know, he comes to understand it and agree with it more and more. I really appreciate the performance when Pete goes all villain on Grace, like talking about they deserve to die because of this, that, and the other. And, you know, I mean, he is making some really great points. And the, yeah, and, and she points out, you know, you still kill someone, so who was it? Roger. Or Dodger. I always get them mixed up, you know, and he, you know, he's he's explaining how, you know, well, I mean, you know, Roger was really terrible to Dodger. He ripped off his nipple when they were still in the utero. You know, just, wow. A uterus. And, let's see. Yeah, and, you know, he says, I'm not going to hurt you. I just want to tell you everything. And it was Roger or me. And <laughs> on the way back from Mandy... Pete McConaughey's Nietzsche. <laughs> I love this show so much. You know, Nietzsche once said, there's your way, and there's my way, and the right way. Well, it just absolutely love it. And, you know, you're, you're seriously quoting Nietzsche? Pete, you're already a murderer. You don't have to also be a douche. And that is true. Like, don't don't quote Nietzsche. Like, seriously, unless you're like, if you're like in a game where like you have to, you know, you have the, someone's trying to make you guess a Nietzsche quote. That's like the one situation where quoting Nietzsche does not make you a just raging douche. So so yeah. And, let's see, yeah, so we, we, you know, it was Pete who killed Boone, you know, for, for Gigi, and we get the thing with, you know, the, the psychotic George Clooney to their Ocean's Eleven, <laughs> which is a wonderful way to, to put that, and, yeah, he, he fired a crossbow into Chanel, which I feel like 99% of all people would do that if they were given the chance. And he explains, you know, the cop, that was in self-defense. And, yeah, we, we get the, some, some detail of, you know, her humiliating, of, of Chanel humiliating Pete. And, you know, he, he says, what self-respecting guy wouldn't try to get revenge? And that's, you know, it's such a damning quote. And, and sadly, it is true of a lot of men. And... <laughs> I do really appreciate. It. I'm I'm always down for a, a reference to Clan of the Cave Bear. Wow, that's yeah, and and they did a good job. Like his makeup does legitimately look like. I I gotta admit, like there was there were a few seconds where I was like, we we're doing this. We're we're actually like I know this is a super offensive show, but that's still like. 
but they're technically referencing a white person playing an indigenous person, so I guess that makes it better. Like, I, I really appreciate how they, like, they think of way, because cause that's the thing, like, if you're, if you try to, like, confront, uh, um, hold on, his name, if you try to confront Ryan Murphy, you know, how could you, how could you have a white guy, like, in makeup to, to look like an indigenous person, he'd probably be like, don't you mean made up to look like another white person, you know, so, just, yeah. And it was very, very funny. Like, he, he, you know, rolling around and doing the grunting and, yeah. I mean, in reality, wasn't it way more messed up when Daryl Hannah did that? You know, it's like, you couldn't have found one indigenous person to, to play this role. That's, yeah. And, uh, let's see. Yeah, and, you know. If you leave now, you'll never know who the other killer is. You know, that's like just ready to, you're you're ready to leave and and suddenly they drop, you know, I know the identity of a serial killer and it's like, okay, fine, I'll stay. Just and yeah, it's one of your sisters. And I really love the, the montage of Pete going all Dexter Morgan collecting DNA. And, like, it's very easy to get DNA from Abigail Breslin because she sticks wads of gum under the table, like, as a matter of course. So just, yeah, you know, grab the... And <laughs> she's yelling at him. No, I don't want your supervisor. I want to talk to the president of Tinder. Your app is clearly broken. Nobody is swiping, you know, on my profile. And it's like, oh, I I have some terrible news for you. <laughs> and yeah, so you know, Pete, the yeah yeah, Pete was just about to say who the killer was. And then the real killer, you know, the killer busts in as, you know, in the, in the full Red Devil costume. So, so it's like, you know, yeah, we, now we know it, it's narrowed down to, it has to be one of the sisters, but which one? And the Red Devil chooses to only, actually, hold on, I, do we see Grace? Yeah, yeah, we see Grace in, later in the episode. Yeah, yeah, so only, only knocking out. And I really the the missive is indeed epic. Like she wasn't, you know. Don't don't make promises you can't keep. Chanel number one did not promise anything she could not deliver. Holy crap! And I really appreciate. I know it's not the only thing that's done it, but the the text showing up on like for a while it's walls, but it's also some other surfaces. And then we get the. You know, and and yeah, we see that you know she's she's being hated, and you know instead of Kappa Kappa Tau, it's crappy crappy cow, which that's a yeah, and you know at, at first it's like well who who leaked it, which you know let's be honest, like it could have been any one of them. There's definitely some animosity between Chanel Number One and the the other sisters, but no, she sent it to all contacts, which is also why there's the thing with you know. On the news, there's also, you know, is Obama as, you know, wow, that's, and, and it is the kind of thing where, like, I, I think they actually may have even mentioned that, you know, she was, she supported Obama, she was, in, you know, which is, like, it's, it's damning, but, but it's very true, there were a number of hateful white people who did support him, you know, so, let's see, and, um, yeah, the the you know really love you know she walks up to the 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 TV and we get all the you know and and it cuts and then everyone is behind her and starts uh, you know shaming her and she's like shaming is great it is one of the great American institutions I love it I helped invent it but not when it's of me <laughs> and it's such a perfect because that's that's conservatism in a nutshell. I like when bad things happen, but not to me, you know, and just, yeah, I, I, I love this show so much, and, 
the yeah, and and she's you know completely spiraling. She she ordered a snake so she can you know go out like Cleopatra. Ch Chanel, this isn't an asp. This is a garter snake. No, but look at its markings. That's a sweater. <laughs> And the, yeah, the thing, you know, words hurt, so, you know, maybe from now on, you can't just say the first hurtful thing that pops into your head. It's going to be so difficult. <laughs> and the, the, yeah, the, you know, the Red Devil busts in. I really love the fact that, you know, at, at first, you know, you know, runs in with a, sort of weapon and you know gets knocked out of his hand it's like um okay and and grabs the first and it's like i mean i guess if you if you had to i guess you can use that but that's not really much of a and you know the, the yeah all of the chanel's gather together the, you know and and you know out comes the the i'm going to explode i should probably let him use the bathroom <laughs> Oh my god. And and yeah, there's a bunch of dynamite strapped to him and he does manage to say, you know, just before the the you know, a few seconds before the explosion. And I love that like when it reaches zero, there's like a second or two where it just plays like the the audio of like a laughing. For like a for for that second or two, I was like Oh, so it's just a oh no, never mind. He blew up, and there's blood everywhere. It just yeah, I I really appreciate that. I can't believe the pizza guy just blew up in front of us. I know. I also was there. <laughs> okay, can we just move on? She keeps wanting me to relive it. <laughs> Could you not make it about yourself for just one second? And she's going to go on an apology tour. She's got the ukulele ready and everything. And, yeah, you know, there was someone with a with a veil saying, Dork, dork, dork. So what? Everyone on this campus is other than me is a dork. But, yeah, it must be Dorcas and... <laughs> Wes and, and Grace are talking about, you know, Oh, so, um, did you, um, you know... Okay, oh, that's that's such a relief. Okay. And then she starts talking about, oh, you know, I really wanted to... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ah, uh, to be anywhere else right now. <laughs> maybe if I think hard enough... Maybe I have psychic powers. If I think hard enough, I can make her stop talking about how much she wanted to have... Sick. Nope, not working. And... <laughs> the, the... You know, his relief at being told, no, they didn't have sex, does not last long. Invasion of the dad bot snatchers. <laughs> I love that reference. That's that's so good. And yeah, the the I, I really love Wes's plans. Like they are just holy crap. When he when he really wants something, there's really nothing he won't do. And you know the the you're gonna uh, you're gonna have to make the playlist of your life. I really love it. like if this were like a a D and D that would be like the thing that that he you know his his most important most effective skill of of all of the just yeah and let's see the yeah so you know Dean Munch comes home and there's all these lights and like I want to say. Rose petals and and you know she walks in and he's lying there and just yeah I don't want to miss a thing <laughs> love that reference just yeah and and yeah so so Chanel number one and three arrive at right and and at first five is also there. At, at the Dorcas estate, I really love the the butler. Um, have I seen Michael Sibbery in anything else? 
Siberi, if that's how you pronounce it. Okay, yeah, he's 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 been in a bunch of stuff. The the um, yeah, just perfect. Like I love how like you're still in like the the I, I, mean, I guess it's like Los Angeles. It's still in America. Why do you have a British butler? Like it's it's. I, I love how nonsensical that, you know, because that's the kind of thing, if if this were, like, a classic horror tale, you know, classic butler kind of thing, you know, and Miss Dorcas doesn't live with anyone other than the Mastiffs that, you know, of, of the estate, and, and they look, they really look aggressive, or, and, yeah, and, and we see... Hester stealing a bunch of Chanel number no. one's stuff, and I I really love so so yeah Grace and Zayde who are both still convinced that the other can't possibly be the killer, they're like going through the the files, and there's a college course on domestic terrorism, and it's like honestly I would not be surprised at this, but I I mean I guess. The one thing I would say is it's not it's not usually like upper class like that's the one thing that upper class conservatives don't do that's awful is is domestic terrorism. But yeah, like it's a it's a very solid joke about how like oh my god, how is this a college course which is you know, a very old joke, but it's really funny. And and I love the details of how, why the file is made up. The the social security number is just one, two, three, four, five, seven, six, seven, eight, nine. You know, and she lives on um, Sesame Street, six, 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 and just, yeah. And then we, yeah, yeah. Um, Chanel number five leaves because there's a you know someone swiped on on her Tinder profile. I, swipe swipe left. I I'm, I don't use Tinder. I I forget which is it swiping left or right. That's anyway. As long as you don't have it on your computer, that's going to be especially ridiculous. But anyway, yeah. If you get it, you get it. The the yeah. There's a, you know, Chanel number one, you know, unusually supportive, especially of Chanel number five. You know, she's she's talking about all the, like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna contact the Pope because this is proof of God's existence in our world, and just, wow. And yeah, so we see the 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 couple postcoital and. Wes is exhausted, which I, I really appreciate this detail of, you know, it's a, it's a cliche, it's a stereotype, and, you know, I'm sure it's not true for everyone, but there is this thing about how, you know, women of the age of 40 or, or past that age are, you know, they've hit, they've reached their sexual peak, you know, where, where, you know, yeah, and it's, Age forty, women reach their sexual peak. A lot of men reach it at thirty seconds, and just I, I really appreciate how it's it's a consistent joke. Like everyone, every guy that she's had sex with, that we've been told on the show that she's had sex with, sex with, it was apparently amazing. Like nobody, no notes. You know, there, there's not a single complaint. And I really love when he describes them having sex. Like, oh my gosh, why is she screaming so loud? You know, they might call the neighbors are going to call the cops. Why am I screaming so loud? They're definitely going to call the cops. Let's see, and yeah, and and then you know, Munch talks about getting rid of Grace, and yeah, and we you know we see Melanie Dorcas, Brian Howie again, such a solid performance. And, you know, she's got, like, this wall of TVs, and one of them is showing Chanel number one. You know, she already, she heard that Chanel number one did this missive to end all missives. And they start, you know, Chanel number one and three argue over, you know, 
does she look like Jason Voorhees? I mean, Jason wasn't. No, no, like with the with the toxic waste. You know, what is that? The only, you know, Friday the Thirteenth you've seen. No, she looks like more for, more like Freddy Krueger. I'm right here. <laughs> toxic Avenger. That's who I was thinking of. And you know the the yeah so. The time has come for the apology. And no, she's not going to apologize. She never apologizes. She's going to try to stab her to death with uh, scissors. And, you know, eventually it becomes clear. No, she, she can't be the killer. So sorry. Just, wow. And I really love that, like, the reason that Chanel Number 1 is certain that Melanie is the killer is because she traveled you know, from Alaska back to, you know, this, this, yeah, America, one week before the killing started, so, I mean, if she was present, she was definitely the killer, which is just, again, like, Chanel number one, such, such a great, like, they really, such great satire of, of conservatives, it's like, well, if someone I don't like was present when something bad happened, it was their fault, just yeah and and the I like the detail that you know yeah for a while she lived in Alaska and then my parents and um, you know informed me that they didn't think it was healthy so they had me transferred back to this mansion where three generations of my family have gone insane <laughs> which like if if you're counting you know the the okay so Melon, you know, the Dorcas estate is where three generations of her family have lost their minds. The the Radwell estate is haunted because a girl showed up uninvited and killed herself, and is now haunting. But you know, it's such a great because these are like you know, there's so many horror stories where there is like, oh, this was the estate where they lost their minds, you know, or this was where, the, you know, this person killed herself and now it's haunted, and this kind of thing. It's not always suicide, but someone died here, now it's haunted. That's a very common horror trope. And, let's see. yeah, and, and, you know, no, Hester is the killer, and they all grab weapons, which I quite like, and... Chanel number one still says that number five has vaginal <laughs> I don't need to see him running out of here with his finger, his index finger cut off. You know, because your because your vag has teeth. And you know, she's like, no, it's it's a fake profile. Look, that's just the guy from Nickelback, and they you know they took it from a magazine. So you would have been happy with the guy from Nickelback. He's sixty. I'm Canadian, you know, it's like, honestly, the idea that, that someone, you know, that, that Nickelback would make an appearance, that is definitely the scariest thing that's happened on this show so far. And yeah, we see, you know, Hester, and she's been like stabbed in the eyeball with the heel of, of a shoe.